Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for an hour of conversation about the role of technologies in the environment. My name is Paz Peña, and I'm based here in Santiago of Chile in Latin America, and I work as an independent consultant. But in recent years, uh, an important part of my work has been you know, focused on investigating the relationship between technologies with the climate crisis and other environmental impacts. I want to introduce you David R. Boyd, the UN Special Rapporteur of Human Rights and the Environment. David is also an Associate Professor of Law, Policy and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. Hello, David. Hello, Paz. Delighted to be joining you from Canada today. Thank you, David. David, and before we begin, I want to remind you that you can you know, ask your questions, make your comments on the chat, and we will uh, try to address them at the end of this session. So, uh, wow, David, there is a wide range of issues, range of issues that we can talk about in this hour, but I want to start with a term that is very familiar to the RightsCom community. Uh, I mean, the technological solutionism, no? this idea that for every social problem, uh, there is a, a technological solution. Mm. And, and it's not because, you know, if people is uh, lazy and doesn't uh, address properly uh, complex social issues. And I think that the technological solutionism is a, a, some sort of natural consequence of the neoliberal ideology where we quit to politics and only find uh, in technocratic approaches the answers, you know? So I want to recall, for example, Margaret Thatcher, who said that there's not such a thing as a society. It's, mm -hmm. There's only individuals and families. So when you, when you don't believe in society, you just quit to politics. And um, technology is uh, a really um, an appealing approach to solve problems. So having said that, David, um, the Paris Agreement explicitly refer, refers to innovation. Mm -hmm. And the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, states that it is crucial to innovate and, uh, uh, to innovate and use what they call revolutionary technologies you know, to improve our lives such as nanotechnology, blockchains, the Internet of Things, and other information and communications technologies. So I want to ask you first, uh, what do you think is, you know, as a general approach, the role of technologies regarding climate change? And how does technological solutionism is also present on the environmental agenda? Yeah, this is such a fascinating topic, Paz. And, and so thank you for asking this question to get us started. You know, I see technology really as a double-edged sword. Technology does offer tremendous potential solutions, but we have such a long track record of technology also creating new problems. And so I think that we have to be very deliberative in our use of technology. We have to be very careful about the types of technology that we're using and creating. Uh, to, to take the example uh, from the context of climate change, as you're mentioning, solar panels are a type of technology and solar panels have become much cheaper and much more efficient over the past 30 or 40 years through scientific research and innovation. And that's really important. So solar panels are part of the solution to climate change. But other people make the argument that nuclear energy is part of the solution to climate change. And we know that nuclear energy is a very dangerous technology. It can uh, have impacts all along the chain from the mining of uranium to the uh, construction and operation of nuclear reactors to dealing with nuclear waste. And so despite the, the amazing science that goes into the design of a nuclear reactor, I don't think that's a technology that's fit for purpose in the 21st century in light of the catastrophes we've seen at mm. Chernobyl, at Fukushima, at Three Mile Island, especially when we have this perfectly safe technology in solar, in wind turbines, and other renewable energies that don't come with those dangers. And, you know, so that's one example of technological solutionism where, where there's both a, a good side and a bad side. Another is something called uh, direct air capture, 
which is this really exciting new technology that, you know, brilliant scientists have created basically a machine that can suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and produce uh, synthetic hydrocarbons, um, fuels that are basically uh, net zero carbon. That's a great technology. Right now it's too expensive, but I expect the costs will come down. But we can't let that potential future technology stop us from taking the actions that are so urgently needed today to address the climate crisis. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm recalling now the, 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 that the U.S. climate envoy, uh, John Kerry, said like one month ago, he said that 50% of the carbon reductions needed to get to net zero will come from technologies that have not yet been invented. Does that mean we have to keep waiting for political action? Can we consider uh, technological solutionism a form of climate change denialism? Yeah, I'm not sure that it's denialism, but it's very troubling for us to hear that kind of comment from someone of, of such stature as John Kerry, because I believe that we actually have all of the solutions that we need to take action right now to address the climate emergency. We should be building renewable energy installations, you know, uh, as fast as humanly possible. Um, so whether that's wind or solar or geothermal or small scale run of the river hydroelectric type projects. So we also face this conundrum when we talk about climate change and energy, you know, Paz, you live in Chile, I live in Canada. We're very, we're very fortunate. We're among the privileged, wealthy nations of the world where the majority of people have access to adequate energy services. But there are still a billion people in the world who don't have any access to electricity. So clearly there is a, a large amount of work to be done to deliver energy services to people living in poverty. At the same time, those of us living in wealthy Western nations are consuming such a vast volume of energy in our daily lives that it's really not sustainable. We couldn't live in a planet with today's population of almost 8 billion people. If everyone lived like us, Paz, we would obliterate the planet Earth. And so part of the solution has to be not only technology, but behavior and values. And I think that's a really important part of the solution that often gets overlooked if we focus too much on technology. Yes, and actually uh, related to that idea, no, to, to think about the, our models of development, no, in terms of what is what th those models are uh, causing to the to, to to the climate. I I, I want to um, to recall the Global e Sustainability Initiative, which is which is a report prepared by the private company Accenture. And they say that ICTs can enable a 20% reduction of global CO2 emissions by 2030, holding emissions at 2015 uh, levels. And I'm quoting, this means uh, we can potentially avoid the trade-off between economic prosperity and environmental protection. The trade-off, again, no, of economic prosperity and environmental protections. So first, I want to ask you if you think there is a trade-off or it's just a false dilemma choosing between economic prosperity or environmental protection. I think we can actually balance the two, but I think in a lot of cases, we are going to have to stop doing some of the things that we're doing today. So I think that, you know, the whole notion of sustainable development is development that meets the needs of today's generation, today's people, without compromising the ability of future generations to fulfill their needs. And what we are doing today in, in our, product, our, our systems of production and consumption, we are currently compromising the needs of future generations. So just a few weeks ago, the German Constitutional Court, in quite a revolutionary decision, in a lawsuit that was brought by young people uh, from mm. Germany and around the world, said that the government of Germany was inflicting radical deprivation on young people in the future by failing to take adequate climate action today. That's really what we're talking about. Our lifestyles today inflicting radical deprivation on people who are going to be living uh, just a few decades from now, unless we change those systems of production and consumption. And so 
Um, yes, we can have economic prosperity. Yes, we can have ecological sustainability, but we can't we can't have everything. We can't have uh, excessive degrees of consumption and uh, the the production. You know, there there are laws of nature, laws of physics that despite our technological ingenuity, we are still bound by and we cannot escape. Do you think that uh, there's different responsibility around this with, you know, developed world uh, and the, uh, you know, uh, the global south? I'm thinking that, uh, that, there's, that there is this uh, uh, fascinating agenda of the growth, you know, where basically people are saying, you know, we cannot, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, still working with this development, development, development model where, we grow and grow and grow the economic, the, our economies need to grow to have uh, this kind of, um, you, you know, uh, development. And, uh, and I'm asking you, is, is this a different responsibility from the global north to the global south? Because it seems like unjust to, 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 to have this, um, this idea of the growth for everyone, no? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely, Pass. I mean, uh, in, in my work as the UN Special Rapporteur, I've traveled to countries like Fiji and Kenya. And if, 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 if someone was to go to Kenya and say, you need, to, you need to have a policy of degrowth, of shrinking your economy, when the majority of people in Kenya are living in poverty, I mean, that's just a crazy idea. That's just totally irresponsible, immoral, unconscionable. But if you look at it from uh, the global perspective, you know, we know that the, the wealthiest 10 or 20 percent of the population are causing at least 80 percent of the environmental damage, whether that's climate change or the loss of biodiversity or air, water and soil pollution. And so it really is incumbent upon that 10 to 20 percent, which is people mm -hmm. like me in Canada, people like you in Chile, people in the in the global north. But wealthy countries have an a moral and ethical and increasingly, I would say, a legal obligation because of international human rights law to take action to address these environmental challenges, which in many cases will require us to shrink the material or ecological footprint of our societies. David, I want to talk a little bit more about green technologies. No? Uh, so an important part of the hope with digital technologies is that they can play a very important role um, in the use of green energy. You know, the classic example, electric cars, for example. No? But in order to use green energy, uh, we must continue to exploit nature. You know? For example, we can look at the case of lithium ion battery production here in Chile. These batteries are the only way to store green energies. You know? And to produce uh, batteries, we need lithium. And to extract lithium, we need intensive exploitation of freshwater and salt flakes in the Andean region. Actually, there's a, a, there's a triangle between um, Chile, uh, Argentina, and Bolivia, call it the lithium triangle, where it's the most important reservoir of lithium in the world. So, again, this uh, intensive exploitation of freshwater and salt floods produced a uh, scarcity of freshwater. Then the displacement of indigenous populations and native species and other, you know, social, economical, cultural effects. So again, you know, another community and another species pay the price of green development. So how can we learn from the mistakes of fossil fuel based extractivist capitalism and achieve an, an energy matrix that is um, sustainable? in the broad sense of the word, no? Or in the deep sense of the word? Right, so I think that, you know, you're, these, are, these are big questions, Paz, and I think that <laughs> I know. what, what we just, really are talking about. Let's try to about, have a, an answer. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, what the world's leading scientists are saying, uh, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, what these world leading scientists are saying is that human society right now is at a critical juncture and we need, to, uh, we need to make systemic and transformative changes to our economies and our societies in order to address these global environmental crises. And green technology is definitely part of the answer. But we have to be really 
cautious about green technologies for the reasons that you're saying. I mean, uh, Bitcoin is seen as one of these exciting digital technologies, but Bitcoin mining is extraordinarily energy intensive. So Bitcoin mining already uses more energy, more, more electricity than the entire country of Sweden. And we're just, you know, we're in the early days of Bitcoin, really. Um, the supply chains that you talk about for electric vehicles, uh, lithium mining, uh, if we talk about computers and uh, cell smartphones, we're talking about rare earth minerals that are sourced from China, uh, African nations, and with real environmental issues and human rights issues involved in those production systems. And so the answer, if you will, I mean, the, the two big answers that I think really have to be at the forefront are, uh, as you mentioned, switching from fossil fuels, which in some ways were a great technology when they were first introduced and enabled part of humanity to become incredibly wealthy and well off. But now the externalities, the downsides of using and burning fossil fuels are crystal clear and we have to shift away mm -hmm. from them to renewable energy as rapidly as we can. And then in the broader context of this econ economic system that you were describing, where we extract natural resources from nature, we manufacture goods, uh, creating vast amounts of uh, pollution and contamination. We use these goods and then we just dispose of them, uh, mm. polluting back into nature. That linear model has to be replaced by a circular economic model where we where we basically reuse, recycle, compost, everything that we make. And this is going to be, you know, we were talking about innovation earlier. This is going to be a real test of human ingenuity and innovation mm. to take this linear economic model that's been in place since the Industrial Revolution and bend it to fit an equitable and sustainable future. Um, it's a huge challenge, but there are exciting things being done all over the world in in terms of trying to make that transition pass. Yeah, absolutely. A circular economy is one of the most uh, exciting things, no? And, and we're going to talk uh, uh, later about that because actually technology has a lot to say on circular economy. But before I wanted to ask you that, you know, um, many of the big tech companies, no, uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, no, are committing to becoming carbon neutral. Uh, and in fact, Google announced, um, I think it was uh, early this year, that its data centers and offices will be carbon-free energy by 2030. But the type of energy matrix, matrix is not the only problem to be solved, no? uh, especially regarding data centers. Um, and in this regard, I would like to focus on the use of water no, in data centers, which in general is a topic that is a little noticed. Data centers consume, consume immense amount of water directly uh, for cooling systems and indirectly through the water requirements of non-renewable electricity generation. Um, some author, authors actually say that Google, for example, considers water use in data centers to be a trade secret. No, there is there is no transparency even for the community who are you know receiving this kind of mega infrastructures in their in their territories. So, what do you think should be the role of technology companies with respect to water, uh, the water use on the one of the most important infrastructures today for the modern world, the data centers? Yeah, well, Paz, as you know, as, a, as the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Environment, I really am a strong believer in transparency. I believe people have a right to information and so that that information on water use should be publicly disclosed. That's the first point. The second point is that if water is being used for cooling, then the technology already exists to, to make that a closed loop so that the same water can be recaptured uh, and, and used over and over again so that it's not a constant consumer of water but rather using that water over and over again for cooling purposes. So, you know, this is a, this is a, a good example of where technology can come to the rescue. Uh, it's more expensive and that's why it hasn't been done yet, but it has been done in some uh, some fossil fossil fueled power plants and nuclear power plants that also depend on large volumes of water for cooling purposes have managed to close that loop, which dramatically reduces 
their water consumption. Yeah, and, and I think this discussion is super important, especially when we think that uh, water resources are in danger because of climate change. Yes. Uh, exactly. And water is a fundamental human right. And so we need to make sure that in every country in the world, there are laws in place that prioritize access to water for human uses and for growing food ahead of industrial uses of water. Um, that's a basic human rights issue, and there, there shouldn't be any question about that. So uh, I want to start uh, talking about circular economy, but I want to make a proxy question before, uh, because many industries say that the digital economy will help the dematerialization of the economy, understood dematerialization as the reduction of the use of resources. No? On the one hand, for example, the digital, the digital economy converts um, products into services. No? Uh, let's think, think about the musical industry or the movies industries where you know, the physical components are not needed because now everything is on stream. Uh, but the, the numbers are saying that this is not enough yet. No, uh, it's, a, it's a little proportion uh, of that. Uh, you know, is that digital com uh, economy can convert products into services. So we need to do more on that. But also, um, the same innovation has meant that we have to renew our devices every year. No. Um, uh, and, and I'm not in only thinking about our cell phones or, you know, our computers, but also I'm thinking about, you know, these um, um, smart device, devices as your refriger refrigerator, you know, your TVs, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to renew all that equipment every year to keep up, you know, with the innovation. So this is increasing what is called the e-waste, you know? Right. Could you share your concerns about e-waste and its environmental impacts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, e-waste has huge environmental impacts and huge human rights impacts. And so, um, you know, the promise of digital technologies in terms of dematerialization will not be reached until we have uh, done away with what I what I describe as designed obsolescence. You know, these so many of these devices are intentionally manufactured in such a way that they cannot be repaired. You cannot replace the battery. Uh, they have a, 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 a very short functional life, and then they are either uh, sent to landfill or they are put into recycling mm -hmm. chains that only extract a portion of the materials that were used to manufacture them in the first place. And often that recycling process takes place in very, uh, dangerous conditions that that are a violation of workers rights a violation of human rights and so this actually connects back everything seems to keep connecting back to this idea of a circular economy to to achieve a circular economy we need product redesign and as well as economic redesign so these products have to be redesigned in such a way that they are easily disassemblable and all of their parts can be reused or recycled and you know there's uh, there's actually a a program in the United States called Cradle to Cradle Certification, which is a terrific uh, private certification process where products that meet certain criteria for recyclability, reusability, um, and and uh, mm -hmm. the safety of, of the chemicals and components used within them can achieve this uh, Cradle to Cradle Certification. I actually believe that Cradle to Cradle Certification needs to move from being a niche uh, a voluntary niche type of uh, program to being embedded in laws that require uh, complete recyclability of pro products. And, and the exciting and positive news is that we're moving in this direction. So for example, in the uh, European Union in Canada, we now have laws that require uh, a certain percentage, uh, it's approximately 90% of all motor vehicles to be capable of being completely uh, disassembled and recycled. So that's, and there's similar laws in place for consumer electronics as well. We need those laws to be stronger, more comprehensive, to apply to everything that we make and use. We also need to clean up the supply chain so that there aren't these really horrific conditions where um, vulnerable populations, people living in poverty are, are exposing themselves to dangerous chemicals as part of 
uh, the recycling process. But we have the capability to clean up that supply chain. We have the technological ingenuity to make products that are uh, cradle to cradle, that are circular in nature. But that's not going to happen without laws that force businesses to do that. And so that's really where our efforts have to lie. I'm really excited excited about circular economy and, and having you in this conversation because I know you are an expert on it. And I really wanted to ask you if circular economy um, can work at the scale that we need for the environmental challenges challenges that we face. Yeah, absolutely it can. I mean, and that's the that's the beauty of the concept of a circular economy is that it's actually the only way that we are going to be able to live in a sustainable fashion with, you know, by 2050, we're going to have 10 billion people more or less living on this planet. The only way that we're going, to, we're going to live sustainability is through a circular economy that reduces the pressure on ecosystems and nature. And, you know, the thing that people have to think about in terms of the circular economy, this is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. Just like the shift from fossil fuels to renewables is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity, the shift from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. I mean, Paz, the, the economic mm. opportunities of these transitions towards sustainability, if we manage them carefully, are phenomenal. They should really, they should really provide benefits to people all over the world. But, you know, um, in Canada and the European Union, we're starting this journey towards the circular economy, looking at plastics. I know people are understandably really concerned about plastics because we see these images of beaches completely covered in plastic. We know that plastic is getting into the to the fish in the oceans, the food that we eat, the, even the water that we drink has plastic microparticles in it. So we really are under the gun to figure out ways that we can alter the plastics economy in a way that prevents plastic from getting into the environment where ultimately it comes back and gets into us. And so that's really one of the leading edges of the push towards the circular economy is how can we redesign plastic products, including packaging mm. and, and systems to make sure that all of the plastic, which is a useful material. I mean, I hear some people saying we should get rid of plastic. I mean, that's just not realistic, I'm afraid. It has too many uses. But what we can do is we can redesign products and we can redesign systems there's a, a system called extended producer responsibility that I'm really excited about, which is where governments pass laws putting the burden of recycling onto the industry themselves, not only to pay for the recycling systems, but to actually operate those systems. And where I live in British Columbia here, we have one of the world leading systems where about six years ago, the government passed uh, a regulation saying that the industry has to collect all of its uh, all of the glass, all of the plastic, all of the metal, all of the paper. So the industry themselves, all of the businesses in BC that are responsible for importing and producing those products, they have formed a consortium. They have built a system that across the entire province collects all of this material and then recycles it. And so that's the way the system has to operate because, you know, in a wealthy place like Canada, even we couldn't afford a uh, uh, effective municipal recycling programs. We have to put the burden on industry. Industry is fantastic at getting their products to the consumer in the most efficient way possible. And what we're learning is that they're just as effective in getting their products back from consumers. And so that's a really exciting uh, step towards circularity in the economy. David, and what, what do you think is the position of uh, uh, technological industry around circular circular economy? Well, as I was saying, every everything needs to be circular, right, Paz? So um, cell phones have to be redesigned, uh, smartphones have to be redesigned, computers have to re be redesigned, all of the mainframe computers have to be redesigned, all of these consumer electronics have to be redesigned, and it has to be companies like Apple and Samsung and others that are responsible for redesigning their products, making sure they're not using uh, hazardous materials in those products, making sure those products can be re recycled and mm. uh, can be reused. And then, you know, so that we so that we actually have that circularity in terms of those technological products. And then, of course, technology has much to offer in terms of how do we actually go about 
those recycling uh how do we build those recycling systems i went to a i went to a new facility that was built in vancouver where they are doing um some of the world's leading plastics recycling and it was incredible to see these uh literally pass it looked like mountains of garbage in this huge mm. huge open building they were being pushed around by tractors and i just thought to myself my god how can this ever be turned into something useful or valuable? It just looked like mountains of garbage. But they go through this um, incredibly complicated system of conveyor belts and computer sensors and blowers and magnets. And you wouldn't believe at the end of this process, uh, you would get big bales of white plastic, of blue plastic number seven. So it's all sorted. And then those giant bales of plastic go to a second facility where the uh, they go through a giant washing machine, then they go through a mm. shredder, and then they go through this other machine. And what comes out are, the day I was there, was little white pellets of uh, plastic that can be remanufactured into um, plastic bottles for drinking water. So, uh, and so they, those pe and then the, that facility was right beside a, a rail line. And so they just, they literally go from this giant machine through a tube fill up rail cars, they go back to the plant where they're making the plastic bottles and the plastic yogurt containers. And you, you, can, you can do that. So that's technology has enabled us to create those kinds of recycling mm. systems. Uh, so the movement, uh, the right to repair, no? the, the right to repair your own devices, yeah. it's super big in the US and in, in, in Europe. Um, so I've been uh, researching on that, and I, I and I, I was, um, you know, uh, not surprised to see that Apple, for example, is known for its barriers the customers try to fix their own devices, including, you know, like physical mechanisms such as um, proprietary screws and you know parts that only um, approved repair shops can access, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Microsoft also has right. arranged an aggressive lobby against the idea in the U.S. Why do you think technological companies uh, should relook the circular economy and, and, and be, you know, be with the, with the idea of the right of, to repair their own devices? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And so, you know, we have something called the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And I think that companies yeah. that are really uh, trying to comply with those guiding principles will be open to having and making products that that do uh, that are compatible with the right to repair. Um, and if companies aren't going to do that voluntarily, Paz, then governments are going to step in and make them do it. And, and that's challenging because these companies are big and powerful, but I think that's where we as you know, digital citizens, we can use the internet to, to come together in huge mm. numbers. And that's where we can, we can use our power as citizens to fight back and say, we demand that governments require corporations to make products that we can repair. You know, you know like there's no reason why, if I've got an, uh, for example, an electric toothbrush, why can't mm. I change the battery? And why do I have to buy a new electric toothbrush every time the battery runs out? That just doesn't make sense to me or a lot of people. We should be able to repair and replace those types of products. Another one that's really important in terms of uh, a huge issue in the, in the development of sustainable transportation is electric vehicles, which have different types of plugs. Well, so are we going to have to have a whole system of charging stations for Teslas, a whole different mm. system of charging stations for uh, for Toyotas. No, that doesn't make any sense at all. The, Sorry, if, yeah. if the companies themselves can't get together and agree on a common technology, then governments will should step in and do it for them. So one interpretation of circular economy um, in the case of technology is that it allows technological self-determinism, no? Um, in other words, it's the people who can decide on what technology to use and what to do with it, no? Repair it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which I think is great, no? Technological self-determinism sounds like a great uh, empower idea, no? Um, but also, uh, I, I'm keep thinking, if, if, if the circular economy is a good business, 
-hmm. a circular economy can be a circular monopoly where these big techs dominate every part of the repair circle no? mm -hmm. uh, of that economy. What are your thoughts about it? Yeah, that's actually, that's a really good point, Paz. And I have to confess that I haven't thought too much about that, but I think that um, there are definitely dangers when we have too much corporate power concentrated in any sector. You know, I'm currently working on a report for the United Nations about food, and I've been really struck to learn how, that a small, hand, really a small handful of companies controls the global pesticide trade, the global seed trade, uh, the global agriculture or uh, veterinary medicines trade, uh, the mm -hmm. farm machinery trade, and so forth. And and that's not healthy. Um, we need, you know, one of the things that's really important to innovation is having uh, opportunities for small companies and startup companies to bring their uh, innovations, their ingenuity to crack the crack into these to enter into these markets. Um, so I think that, and, and again. You know, I, I'm sounding like uh, I'm putting a lot of weight on the shoulders of government, but, um, you know, we definitely need to be concerned about ensuring competition. And if that means breaking up some of these monopolies, um, that's maybe what we have to do. You know, another example of that, we've seen the way that corporations take advantage of low corporate tax rates to um, yeah. avoid paying any taxes at all. Some of these large technology corporations are uh, among the most guilty in that in that regard. So, um, you know, it's encouraging to see governments in the G7 last week say that there are they're going to establish minimum levels of corporate taxation. That's something that should happen in every country across the world uh, in the, in much the same way that governments are going to have to take action to deal with excessive concentration of corporate power in the technological sector. David, if let's say. I'm in the US, no? Uh, so I want to repair my cell phone, which basically I have to, to renew my cell phone every year because the battery, whatever, no? Um, so I want to repair my cell phone. So the uh, manufacturer industry is probably there and the software industry is probably there. And they're probably gonna provide, if everything is okay and they are agree with this right to repair, they're gonna provide the, to the consumers with the, I don't know, the instructions, uh, you know, the, the, the explanations, et cetera, the, everything that you need to repair your own device. But what happened in the global south? For example, here in Chile, where we don't produce technology, no, we just produce uh, mainly uh, uh, natural uh, resources, et cetera. But so my phone, Probably the, the industry of the, uh, the, 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 the hardware is produced, I don't know, in India. China, China probably. But the software is produced in, I don't know, the UK. So it's super difficult to have that kind of accountability from the, from the companies to give us in Spanish, you know, the instructions, you know, the whole, um, you know, um, materials to repair our products. Uh, what, what, what do you think about, you know, this, again, no, this inequalities uh, uh, around the, the, the circular economy with North, the, the global North and the global South? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are definitely potential inequalities, but, you know, if, if I take one example, Paz, like um, watch repairs. So, you know, watches may not be manufactured in Chile, but I bet you in Santiago, you can find somebody to change the battery on your watch or repair your watch. Um, those kinds of those kinds of abilities, those kinds of skills are not limited to wealthy countries. So I think that, you know, as long as these products were manufactured in such a way that it was possible to repair them, that you would see a, a really healthy uh, sector in all countries in the world, because there's bright young people who are capable of learning you know, through YouTube videos, how to repair a, a, a smartphone, how to repair uh, a laptop computer. So I think that actually, if if governments in the in the wealthy countries put the impetus on these corporations to make their projects their pro their to make their products repairable, I think they would actually be a, a a job creator right across the world. That you would have whether you're in Santiago, Chile, whether you're in Mumbai, India, or whether you're in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, you could take it down to a, some shop uh, and that 
they would have like some smart young people there who could change the battery or fix the problem. I, I'm sure that would actually happen. In terms of inequality, you know, I have to admit, I'm, I'm much more concerned about the, the ongoing disparities of wealth between the global north mm. and the global south and, and the way that countries in the global north are contributing to and exacerbating these global environmental crises that we've touched on um, and not taking a sufficient degree of responsibility for solving these problems. You know, the climate emergency is caused by wealthy people in wealthy countries, and we have a moral and legal obligation to solve the problem uh, by reducing our emissions, also by assisting uh, countries in the global south to adapt to the inevitable impacts of climate change. And also, people forget about this, there's, a, there's three pillars of climate action. One is mitigation, which is reducing emissions. One is adaptation, which is preparing for climate change. And the third pillar, which people forget about, is something called loss and damage, which is part of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it's basically compensating people in low-income countries and small island developing states for the damage that climate change is already having on their lives. Um, wealthy countries made a pledge in Paris in 2015 to mobilize $100 billion a year in climate finance for adaptation in the global south. Mm. We haven't we haven't kept that promise. That's a real uh, that should be that should be headline news. That should be an embarrassment yeah. to people in the north. Loss and damage is even worse. Not a single dollar, not a single euro, not a not a single penny has changed hands to compensate people. And I've witnessed, you know, the damage that's been uh, inflicted by uh, severe tropical cyclones in Fiji, for example, where people yeah. have been rendered homeless through no fault of their own, but through uh, severe storms that are being made more severe and more frequent by climate change, we have to, we really have to address both the adaptation and the loss and damage things, which will effectively transfer some amount of wealth from the north to the south. Uh, questions are coming from the audience, but before that, um, I, 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 I want to talk about activism because I, I think it's so, so important. Um, and we cannot talk about environmental activism without recognizing the fundamental role of activists, especially land defenders and indigenous communities. What do you think has been the role of technologies in their activism? Um, well, I think technology has been a double-edged sword for these uh, defenders of land, for defenders of human rights. It's been a really positive development because it connects people together. It has been used in, in many cases around the world uh, to enhance their security, to protect themselves, but also to build their networks, to get larger numbers of people supporting their efforts. That's the positive side of these technologies. The negative side is that these same technologies are being used and exploited by governments and businesses to suppress these defenders, to uh, you know, to monitor mm. the work that they're doing, uh, to track their movements, and so there's, as I said, it's a double-edged sword that has some very positive aspects, but also some very negative aspects. Uh, a question from the audience is, is, is really related to uh, activism on circular economy. They ask, how are indigenous people uh, involved? in defending what a proper circular economy should be? Aha, uh -huh. that's a great question. And you know, I right, would say, right? I, I would actually say that indigenous people are the original inspiration for the circular economy. Because if you look at the way that indigenous, indigenous cultures uh, and indigenous economies operated for literally tens of thousands of years around the world, they were, uh, they were everything that they made and they used was capable of being reused, recycled or composted. So, you know, there aren't any indigenous nuclear waste dumps. There aren't any indigenous contaminated sites anywhere in the world. Um, there are certainly indigenous peoples who have been in, impacted by Western contaminated sites, Western nuclear dumps, but they, they have not created any of their own. So um, I think that we draw that inspiration from indigenous wisdom. Um, to the extent that indigenous people are involved in the transition to a circular economy, that's something that uh, is definitely taking place around the world. We have indigenous uh, communities and indigenous people at the forefront of the transition 
to renewable energy, for example. Um, and so I expect that Indigenous people will be highly engaged in the transition to a circular economy as well. Another question is, how do you reconcile the message of combating climate change as an individual responsibility uh, with the structural change needed across many extractive and extractive extractive industries mm. um, to prevent catastrophic loss of bio biodiversity and damage of our planet? That's a big question, no? Yeah, it's a big question. And it's really striking, though, because, you know, the, the big oil companies, the big fossil fuel companies, they would love this to be an issue of individual responsibility because it absolves them of responsibility. And that's that goes back to my earlier point about transformative and systemic changes. We need we need more than individual action. We need collective action. We need systemic change. So, you know, it's really, again, I keep coming back to these signs of progress, but, mm. you know, there are now more than 30 countries that are committed to ending the use of coal-fired coal electricity generation by 2030. That's, that's a really encouraging sign because coal is, ter coal, coal is a, is a double, double danger. It's terrible in terms of air pollution and it's terrible in terms of climate change. Um, so, you know, and individuals, you and I don't have the power to say that coal, coal fired power plants should shut down. That's something that government action is necessary for. But, you know, the, the brilliant Fridays for the Future movement, the, that kind of yeah. energy, passion and creativity of young people. I think they deserve credit for the fact that we are now seeing countries moving faster to address the climate emergency. It was young people in Germany that brought that lawsuit. It was young people in Colombia that brought a, a lawsuit leading to the Colombian Supreme Court ordering Colombia to end deforestation in the Amazon. Um, young people are really at the forefront of the, the climate movement. And that, that movement is resulting in not only individual changes, because these young people are really, you know, they're, they, they are walking the talk. They are taking actions themselves. I mean, I meet so many young people who are vegans and vegetarians because of the climate emergency. Um, so many young people who won't fly to conferences. They, you know, they're happy to participate virtually, but they won't fly to a conference. Greta Thunberg, of course, who sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, um, you know, the leader of the Fridays for Future movement. So I think that we, we are in a position where we need systemic changes. We need countries to phase out coal-fired electricity. We need countries to stop. You know, this was really fascinating. Just a few uh, a few weeks ago, the International Energy Agency, you know, the world's leading energy expert, says. We have to stop um, exploring for and uh, creating new fossil fuel infrastructure. That mm. message is so powerful in terms of changing the system so that people, people who are ordinary citizens like you and I, when we, when we, when we turn on our, uh, when we turn on our lights at night, we know we're getting clean electricity. We don't have to make a, a choice when we, when we go, yeah. uh, when, when, when we're making transportation decisions, the all of our choices should be clean transportation choices, you know. And so that's that's systemic changes that are needed to to make us um, to to empower us as as green citizens. I know we have a little time, but uh, I, I I want to go back to one uh, answer that you you uh, gave about um, how uh, technologies is playing also a uh, role of surveillance uh, against uh, land defenders and, uh, you know, uh, environmental activists. Um, do you think that today environmental activists have the necessary support in terms of digital security? Uh, I think in some places they do, but I think there's a lot of places in the world where activists need more support in terms of digital security. And that's something where the, you know, the, 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 the digital and technological community could really provide a helping hand. And this is a very serious issue. People are shocked to learn that uh, environmental human rights defenders who are you know, ordinary people who are you know, trying to protect their land, trying to protect our environment from mm. uh, irreparable harm, they are being murdered, hundreds of people every year. The last, the last report that I saw was over 300 people murdered last year for, for, for being activists to protect land, air, and water. Um, and that's the tip of the iceberg, right? Because beyond that, there's many more activists uh, and yeah. human rights defenders who are being threatened, harassed, intimidated, 
uh, put in jail. And so, you know, improving the digital security of those people is a really, uh, really important step. Yeah, absolutely. And many of those land defenders are women that are, you know, facing rape, uh, you know, uh, menaces and et cetera. So I think it's super, super serious. Yeah, I was on a call recently with four uh, female human rights defenders from uh, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala and Nicaragua. And all four of them told stories that that really just were hard to hear, hard to listen to. I mean, powerful, emotional stories of violence that had been inflicted upon them simply because they were trying to protect water or protect air or protect the biological diversity that their communities and in many cases indigenous communities depend on. You know, this is this is where we're at. We're we're at, at a place in in human history where these people are heroes for the planet, but they're being treated like criminals and terrorists. And we really need a lot more people to stand up and and speak up on behalf of those people who are putting their lives and their and their the li livelihoods on the line for the benefit of all of us. David, um, in the last year, we have heard a lot about fake news and disinformation campaigns on social networks, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that social networks have contributed uh, to climate change denialism? Yeah, I think there's no question that they have. I mean, the, the algorithms, for example, on Facebook that you find is that people, if people uh, have have And, and Google as well. If people have looked up one article that says, you know, climate change is fake, um, then then they'll the next time they do a search, they'll get that that perspective will be reinforced over and over again. That happens on Google. That happens on Facebook. And so these big social media companies, they have to do something. We have to find a way to change this because people need to be acting on solid information. We're seeing that again with the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, the amount of misinformation that's out there on the internet about the safety of vaccines is incredible. Listen, yeah. people, the vaccines are safe. The vaccines are saving millions of lives. And it's just grossly irresponsible for uh, these companies to be um, amplifying and perpetuating these myths about vaccines. I, I think it's, a, it's an absolutely criminal situation. So here's another question uh, from the audience. Um, I think it's Teresa. So many smart appliances are exported and available in developing countries where programs like the Cradle to Cradle are not available. What can be done to assist in establishing such programs to safely dispose of this waste in these countries around the world? Yeah, that's a great question. And that comes back to something that I was referring to earlier, which is uh, this concept of extended producer responsibility. So I've been doing some work with the government of Kenya on this because the reality is that, you know, in, in countries in the global south, they, they face so many challenges right now. They face poverty. They face lack of, uh, yeah. lack of education. You know, right across the infrastructure is not adequate. So these governments really can't take on the additional burden of being responsible for running recycling programs. But the companies that are manufacturing and importing these products, whether it's, you know, these are these are big global corporations that are that are in that are in Canada and Europe, they are already operating these kinds of um, consumer take back systems. So there's absolutely no reason that governments in Kenya, South Africa, Mexico, Chile, you know, all across the global south should be saying to these global corporations, look, if you want to sell your smart washing machine or your smart refrigerator in this country, then you have to put together a program that when that refrigerator or that washing machine breaks or it reaches the end of its uh, life cycle, you take it back. You pay for the system to collect it. You pay for the system to recycle it. And that's how we'll get progress towards a circular, circular economy that's fair right mm. around the globe. Um, and we talked about plastic earlier. I'm really excited about the fact that next year in Nairobi, Kenya, um, at the United Nations Environment Assembly, I believe that negotiations are going to launch on a new global treaty to deal with plastics that should result in um, global standards so that we have like global standards for the different types of plastic that are being used and also global standards that will impose upon these corporations requirements to um, to 
build and uh, establish complete complete and comprehensive recycling systems. David, I know we have only five minutes left, but I, I really want to 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 hear your message to the RightsCon community you know, uh, regarding why we should look at the environmental agenda and what is the uh, role of technology in this. I know we have been talking around, you know, about this in the whole in the whole panel, but I really would like to to ask you to stress a message uh, for the rights of community, uh, because I think this is such an important issue. Uh, for me, we should have to, you know, we should talk about this in the whole, you know, uh, conference because it's, it's, it's key. Um, right. So what, what is the message that you can give to the rights con community? Well, I think my basic message is this, Paz. Look, the, the RightsCon community, as I understand it, is incredibly diverse. You know, people from every walk of life, every corner of the world. But here are some things we have in common. We all depend on clean air to breathe. We all depend on clean water to drink. We all need uh, nutritious and uh, healthy food to, to sustain our bodies. We all ultimately depend on healthy ecosystems and biodiversity for a whole range of services that are invisible to us that we don't think about. You know, you know, in, in my office with my computer, I don't think about the fact that wetlands are purifying water, that birds and bats and bees are, are pollinating the crops that are that are ultimately coming through the grocery store into my house and feeding myself and my family. We have so much in common as human beings in terms of our dependence on air, water, soil, and biological diversity, as well as a stable climate and non-toxic environments in which we can live, work, study, play, and flourish. And all of those elements are part of something that we call the right to live in a healthy environment. And I really think that for, for anyone, no matter what your interest is in technology, we need to think of ways that technology can be harnessed to improve and restore our environment because we know that it's in trouble. We Everybody knows there's a climate emergency. Everybody knows that biodiversity is declining. Everybody knows that there's too much pollution in the world. And what we've talked a lot about today, Paz, is that we have solutions to those problems, but we need to accelerate the pace of implementation of those solutions. And we also have to really look at our world with clear glasses and recognize that there are a billion people in this world today who don't have access to safe water. There's close to a billion people who don't have enough food to stop them from going to bed hungry. Um, and those are the people that are suffering the most because of these global environmental problems. These are the people for whom climate change is, is making their lives eat that much more difficult because water is becoming more scarce or because fish that they've depended on to feed their families are becoming more scarce. And so, you know, my message is we're all in this together and we are, uh, everybody who is attending RightsCon is a person of privilege. And we need to examine that privilege and think about what it means to be a global citizen in the year 2021. What can we do and what can we give back that will help move humanity towards a more sustainable and a more equitable future? And I think that's something that it, it, I don't I don't know if you're a you're a video game person or if you're a uh, a, a smartphone manufacturer, that's something that's common to all of us, that we can all get together and we can build a better world together. Thank you. Thank you, David, for those words. It's, it's really inspiring. Um, regarding some questions on the chat, uh, asking for more details on data centers and the consume of resources of data centers. There's a lot of literature, literature about that, but I strongly uh, recommend the latest APC report uh, on uh, uh, of Giswatch, uh, who is completely dedicated to technology and the environmental impact. So thank you very much, David, again. It's, it's been a pleasure and my honor to have this conversation with you. Well, great conversation, Paz. I can't believe the hour's gone by so quickly. So thanks for such a, a great bunch of questions. And, and I hope we can continue this conversation another time. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined us to, for this fire chat. Thanks also to the Access Now technical team for all their support. See you around 
Bye to everyone.